Uh, as I was driving to Berlin for work this week, as you know, I, I keep calling it Berlin. It's not Berlin. It's Berlin. Berlin. Yes. Berlin. I sometimes have to drive that. You know, it's a two-hour trip from here. Um, I have a lot of time to contemplate, a lot of time to pray, a lot of time to praise the Lord and sing, especially as I'm driving through the mountains. And boy, are they beautiful. They're so beautiful. But I found myself pondering a devotion that was based on 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I had read the entire chapter before I went to bed on Tuesday night, and it struck me in a beautiful way because it reminded me of each of you. And I do wish everyone was here this morning. I woke the next morning with it on my heart, and I knew it was where the Lord wanted me to go next. But before I get into our exegetical study this morning, I want to share a bit about my experiences in ministry. The title of this message this morning is called, You Matter. You Matter. I've been bringing a lot of really um, serious messages lately about sin and about being kingdom-minded kingdom minded, and how we need to walk as believers and how we need to live and how we need to obey the fullness of the Word of God. Not just the stuff that we like, right? And I thought it was time. Maybe the Lord wants me to do something now to, to build you up a little bit. So I want to share a little bit. I hope that's okay. Did you know I've been serving the Lord for almost 30 years? Wow. <laughs> Hard to believe. Seven years ago, though, I find myself despairing in the very place that had always felt like home to me, the place where I felt most fulfilled, my home church. It had been my safe place, my home church, for 26 years. Sorry, I lost my space. It was a place that was filled with light and love and laughter, service. But at the time, it was filled with angry, gossipy, divisive, reactionary, and sadly adulterous people. I did not want to be there any longer. I felt I did not fit in. I felt I did not belong. I felt none of my gifts or talents were being used as they should have been used because nothing I did brought taught, sang, or shared, raised so much as an eyebrow, never mind the body, or did it appear, nor did it appear to in any way make a difference, the things I tried to impart. It broke my heart. People, instead of realizing the message was for them, for us, only pointed their fingers at others, which is common, of course, in the church today. And sadly, it was common even in Jesus' time. He called them hypocrites. I know this is tough. But I prayed about it, and the Lord told me to bloom where I was planted. And I said, okay, Lord, I will do as you ask, but have no clue how. He said simply, you just need my word. I have no idea how many times I heard that over those, those seven years and prior. But later that year, the Lord set me apart and called me to ministry, and I was ordained as a pastor. I learned, I grew, I worshiped, I preached, I prayed, I worked, I served, and I suffered. I didn't suffer for myself. I suffered for the people. I suffered for Christ. And then the unthinkable happened. The thing everyone feared would happen our pastor, the one everyone looked to, the one everyone used and took advantage of, the one the community despised, suffered a stroke. 
he could no longer lead, and once again, I found myself despairing as members became even more divided, harsh toward his wife, filled with hate and malicious gossip. I could go on. Families had left years before. No children were in attendance. Nothing I taught the adults got through. Many stopped going to the adult Bible classes, both Sunday and Wednesday night. Their love waxed cold. Why? They didn't want to hear the truth. Let's face it. Who really wants to hear they're in error when they believe they're right? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. They were so caught up in the world view, they could not, no, actually they would not, see their own sin. When the time came for our church to begin, I was tired, spiritually, mentally, and emotionally spent. All I wanted was to quit and go to a place where I could be ministered to for a while. But again, I heard that still small voice, that gentle and tender whisper saying, bloom where you are planted. I know the plans I have for you. I will fulfill them in you. Trust me, watch, wait, and see. I asked the Lord to let the responsibility of all of it to pass. I wanted it to pass to John. I wanted it to pass to anybody, for anybody but this unworthy, incapable vessel. But then I surrendered to his will. Why did I share this? Sometimes it's tough going back. And I tried very hard not to go back because those times were very painful. But they were also a time of great growth. As I sit here this morning looking at each of you, and oh, how I wish Gordon was here too. And knowing what you have been through, what you are doing, how you have stood firm, how far you and I have come. I am ever so thankful that I did not listen to my flesh. I did not give up. I obeyed the Spirit. I am so very proud to serve you. I am so thankful to the Lord for his leadership in all of our lives and in the building of this ministry. Listen, like me, many people do not understand that they matter that they have gifts and talents and therefore are an important part of the body, that God has purpose for them and a plan for their lives, a plan only they, with God's guidance, can fulfill. Mm -hmm. Did you catch that? God has a plan for your life, but it will not be fulfilled without you putting an effort into living it out obeying his voice and surrendering to his leadership, to his will, no matter how you feel in the flesh. It isn't about your emotions. I hope you're understanding me. This, this, and what it's promised to become will not happen without you and without me. And without us, we all matter. We all are part of the body of Christ. This is why I feel the Spirit wanted me to go through this portion of Scripture and read today an exegetical study of God's Word. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to first read verses 1 through 3. Now, dear brothers and sisters, regarding your question about the special abilities the Spirit gives us, I don't want you to misunderstand this. You know that when you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept along in worshiping speechless idols. So I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God will curse Jesus. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except 
by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. Paul has written this letter uh, to the holy people of God, beloved members of the body in Corinth, who obviously had written a letter, right? They must have written a letter to him. And so he's responding to them. He's responding to a direct question that they had pertaining to the supernatural gifts of the spirit. He says to the body, pay attention. Don't be led astray with wrong thinking again, as you once were by false gods and dumb idols, idols that could not speak. How many false gods do people worship today? Money, medicine, government, politics, news, pagan religions, nature. I could go on and on and on. They lead the people of God astray if we fail to pay attention. And this is a clear warning. Don't go back. Listen to my teachings. Follow Jesus. This is what Paul is saying. If you are truly filled with the Spirit, we cannot say that Jesus was cursed. As found in Deuteronomy, remember, it says a man that's hung on a tree is cursed. If we truly have the Holy Spirit, we understand Jesus was not cursed. Amen. He had victory. He put himself on that cross. Don't go back, it says. Mm. Also, we cannot in all sincerity say he is Lord. There are people who can lie. They can say out loud, yeah, Jesus is Lord. But not really mean it in their spirit. Not really know it in all sincerity. They certainly can lie, which is why having gifts of discernment are extremely important. Let's continue. Verses 4 through 6. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of them all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. There are varied gifts of the Spirit. This portion makes clear that the same God gives them to us. He is our source and leads us in all service. All comes from Him and through the faithful returns to Him as well. Brings Him glory. Fills up the kingdom. Amen. Amen. 7 through 11. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. So that means every believer. To one person, the spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. To another, the same spirit gives a message of special knowledge. The same spirit gives great faith to another. And to someone else, the one spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. Have you ever heard? Uh, <laughs> I'm sure we all have. There's been many, 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 many prophecies, has there not, about our nation, about who knows about any number of things? How do we know whether or not it's coming from the Holy Spirit or from a person? There are people who believe that they have the gift of prophecy and so they speak out, but it has no way of building up the body. Why? Because it does not actually come from the Word of God. Am I making sense? I mean, 
If you don't know what the word of God says, how do you know what the Lord is going to say? How do you know that the, the word of the Lord that's coming through you is really from the Lord? How do you know the word is really from the Lord coming from another person if you don't know the word? If you don't know the word, you don't know God. If you don't know God, you can't discern. Am I making sense? I hope I am. Okay. Though there are many other gifts of the Spirit as found in the book of Romans, you might want to write this down if you want to do a study of the gifts of the Spirit. They're found in the book of Romans, Ephesians, Proverbs, 1 John, 2 Timothy. But for the purposes of this study, our focus is on the nine spiritual gifts mentioned in this particular portion of Scripture. Paul states here that all believers are given certain gifts of the Spirit. You will find other evidence making the same claim throughout the Bible. For example, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Is he saying some of you have gifts? Or is he saying all of you? Now let's turn to Romans 12, verses 4 through 6. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. In His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, Speak out with as much faith as God has given you. That in itself is a gift which we'll talk about. Because we believe in the fullness of the word of God, we can plainly see and agree. It says every member of the body receives at least one of these special spiritual gifts. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have at least one of these gifts from God. I'm beating that up, aren't I? getting it through you have it the following i'm going to break out in three sections the following gifts of the nine i'm going to i'm going to break them out in, in three different sections gifts of utterance it has to do with speaking doesn't it mm -hmm. those are speaking in tongues interpretation of tongues and prophecy speaking in tongues as paul says later on in chapter uh, i believe chapter um 15 He's talking about how speaking in tongues is a wonderful thing, but I'd rather have you prophesy. Speaking in tongues typically does not edify the church. It edifies the person as it's your personal prayer language between you and God. But sometimes the Lord will give you a, an utterance that is meant to be interpreted for the edification of the church. So there's two different types of tongues there, isn't there? And then there's prophecy. All of it comes and speaks. And we have a person in this church who has that gift, don't we? Her name is, her name is Sue. I wish she was here this morning. She has the gift of prophecy. John has the gift of prophecy. It builds up. It edifies the church. A word for today, a word for tomorrow. It builds up. It edifies. Then there's gifts of instruction and revelation. The word of knowledge. The word of wisdom. The discerning of spirits. These are special gifts that we have of revelation. Word of knowledge. I'm trying to think of a good illustration for that, and it's not coming to me right now. But I had something earlier when I was going through this. And isn't it funny how that works? And you don't write it down. I'll just continue. Word of wisdom, we think of Solomon. There he is again. <laughs> what a wise king he was. And things he would do. Surprising things. But with wisdom. Discerning spirits. Let's think about the woman who was able to tell fortunes. She made people rich off of that. She was a slave. But they knew it. They rebuked the spirit. 
because they discerned the spirit was not of God. Gifts of power or impartation. That's faith. Let's think about Peter walking on the water. <laughs> Whew. What incredible faith. We all have faith. We all have faith to believe in Jesus Christ, right? That's why we're here. We believe in the word. We believe in fellowship. We believe in coming together. We have faith in God Almighty. But it takes special faith to get out of a boat and walk on water. There are people today who have that kind of faith. When I, we were praying about the persecuted church this morning. The people that are living in caves right now. People that are hiding from the Taliban. They're afraid. But they're still standing up for the Lord. It takes incredible courage to do that. To stand down, stare down your enemy and stand firm on your faith no matter what. It takes incredible faith. God has imparted that. Through the Holy Spirit, gifts of healing, gifts of miracles, signs, and wonders. Walking on the water again, what a miracle that was. Or how about that helicopter this week? Anybody read that in the news? No? Hmm. What happened? Tell us about it. Um, well, I saw, I saw a big headline that Del De Taliban is so angry with Biden because... He gave them malfunctioning hel helicopters. <laughs> Praise oh, God, they praise malfunctioned. God. <laughs> yeah. Paul makes it clear that every gift comes from the Holy Spirit. Our faith in God and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit can lead us to work in each of these gifts. Typically, a believer will have at least one primary gift. Sometimes, however, we can serve in other gifts as the Spirit leads, such as heal the sick, bring a word of knowledge, or prophesy. Though not impossible, all things are possible for those that love the Lord, right? It is not typical for one person to operate with all of the gifts at the same time. But that does not mean we cannot serve with different gifts at different times when the Holy Spirit prompts us to do so. So to explain further, I will share a little bit from my own experience. My prim primary gift is administration and teaching. Um, I don't feel like I'm doing a great job this morning, but still, <laughs> those are where I typically um, do well. Um, but occasionally, um, occasionally, the Lord will give a gift of healing. So when we have people come up for prayer, sometimes people are healed. So you, you have the gift of administration, leadership, being able to um, teach others, and the gift of healing that comes on occasionally, right? So each one of us has a primary gift we work in, but occasionally we may work in a different gift as the Spirit prompts. Okay, it is all about faith and trusting the Spirit to lead and surrendering to His will. We just had a baptism, and if I were to look at either of the gentlemen that received from the Holy Spirit, I can tell you that Armand has the gift of discernment and exhortation. Exhortation is a, is a, a word that um, corrects, okay? And he gets that often. But he can discern when something is not right. And he can speak out a word of exhortation. As he matures in his walk and increases in his knowledge of the word, he will be able to use those gifts to help build up this body and others outside our church as well. Now, if I were to look at Bill, I can tell you he has the gift of giving. He's a very generous man. This gift is not mentioned in this portion of scripture that we're reading today, but it is elsewhere and mentioned earlier. As he grows in his walk with the Lord, he will learn to discern who to give to and to whom he should not. He will come to understand that. He will also learn how to give in different ways. Not out of his own intellect, but through the prompting of the Holy Spirit, through discernment. It is so cool to watch new believers mature in faith. 
Now let's get into the rest of the chapter. We're going to talk about the body and its varied parts. Verses 12 through 14 in 1 Corinthians. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews. Some of us are Gentiles. Some are slaves and some are free. But we have all been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. No Lone Rangers. Not that long ago, I had somebody accuse me of trying to be a Lone Ranger. I can honestly tell you, not in this church. I'm not the only one who's serving here. We are all serving together, and this is how it should be. Amen. We are not meant to work alone. We are meant to serve together as members of the same body. And listen, I'm not just talking about us believers in this church. I'm talking about believers all around our community, in other churches. We are to work together to help build up and raise up the body and bring increase to the kingdom. Amen? Amen. A remarkable contrast. This is a remarkable contrast when we consider both the times in which Paul was ministering in and our times today. Isn't it true when I say the status is everything to some people? But here Paul makes it clear we are in this thing together and united by the same spirit. It makes no difference who we are, where we come from, what color our skin is, the shape of our eyes, the language we speak, what type of home we live in, what clothes we wear, what job we have, what car we drive. None of it has any bearing whatsoever in God's economy. Thank the Lord. We are one and the same in Christ. And that's good news. Verses 15 through 20. If the foot says, I'm not a part of the body because I am not a hand, that does not make it any less part of the body. It's just as important. And if the ear says, I am not a part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts and God has put each part just where he wants it. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. No one is inferior. So often people do not know their own worth. And oh, don't we like to use our past and our childhood and the different things we've been through in life. We blame our behaviors on these difficulties in life situations. That isn't what God wants for us. But so often people do not know their own worth. It, would be because, it could be because their background, their childhood, their lack of understanding. But Paul is emphasizing the fact that every believer has a part in the body. Every believer is a part of the body and every believer is important to the body. I don't care what your father or mother, sister or brother or whomever has ever said to you or done to you. Your truth is now in Christ you matter. You are important. You have a gift. What are you going to do with it? Hide it? Light a light like a light under a bush or share it and change your world? Verse 21 through 26. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact, some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen. 
while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. This is a beautiful part of the cha this chapter. The world often disregards the weakest among us. They bully, hate, persecute, belittle, and despise those that appear to be less important or of less value. But here, Paul is bringing kingdom thinking to the group of believers and stating that it does not matter who you are. You are not any better than any other member of the body. He says the weaker parts of the body become the most necessary. In fact, he is sharing a principle that Jesus brought to the disciples when he said, the greatest will become the least and the least will become the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And so it should be in the church. In these verses as well, Paul may be saying, when we see a member who becomes weakened or perhaps appears to be in a place less dignified, needing shelter, needing covering, we are to act as that covering, to help and hold them up. We can all have times of stumbling. It's how we treat the stumbler that matters, loving correction, not judging, guiding in the word, and with our love being plainly evident, a person falling into sin sinfulness can turn to repentance. These things are precious in the sight of God. If we can remember, if we can remember that, remain humble, lose any sense of pridefulness or ego. Oh, what God will do with this little congregation. Verses 27 through 31. All of you together are Christ's body, and each of you is a part of it. Here are some of the parts God has appointed for the church. First are apostles, second are prophets, third are teachers, then those who do miracles, those who have the gift of healing, those who can help others, those who have the gift of leadership, those who speak in unknown languages. Are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Mm -hmm. Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown languages? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages? Of course not. So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts, but now, let me show you a way of life that is best of all. And then he goes into the love chapter, chapter 13. Oh, Father. Earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. No, not everyone. As I said early, not all of us can work in all of those giftings. Not all of us are called to be apostles. Not all of us are called to be teachers. Not all of us are called to heal. Not all of us are called to perform miracles. If the Lord wants to use us in those ways, he will. What should we do? If we are not sure of what we are supposed to do or who we are or what our gifts are, what should we do? Pray. We should pray. We should ask. And the Lord, the Holy Spirit, will impart the gifts we are meant for. Okay? He's not going to take... A person who is shy he can but he may not take a person who is quiet and unspoken like Armand and make him an apostle or make him an evangelist but he will use him in leadership in another way am I making sense mm -hmm. I hope so Who are we? What is this telling us? Who are we? We are the members of the body of Christ. All of us together make up the whole. We all, 
each and every one of us have a purpose set before us by God. We are to desire the greater gifts so we may edify or build up the church in order to bring Christ to our communities and everlasting, or, or I'm sorry, and elevating them to salvation. Isn't that what we are supposed to be? Go ye therefore into all nations, preaching the word of God, right? Make disciples. Can't do that if we only serve in here. We have to serve out there, amen? So I want to ask you a question before I close. And actually, Jennifer, I want to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, not 1 through 5, though. I think I want to go through, I think it's um, 20, 25. Well, all right, I'll read 1 through 5. Let love be your highest goal, but you should also desire their special abilities. The Spirit gives especially the ability to prophesy. For if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God since people won't be able to understand you. You will be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will all be mysterious. But one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. Five. Oh, I'm on four. Sorry. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. I wish you could all speak in tongues, but even more, I wish you could all prophesy. For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues unless someone interprets what you are saying so that the whole church will be strengthened. Now, Jennifer, thank you. Listen, their secret thoughts will be exposed. No, that's not it. 26 maybe no um i'm so sorry i had it what is this oh that's what i'm looking for well my brothers and sisters let's summarize when you meet together what happens in this church one will sing another will teach Another will tell some special revelation God has given. This happened this morning. One will speak in tongues. We did this in prayer, some of us. And another will interpret, though I didn't have an interpretation this morning. But this is what happened today. But everything that is done must strengthen all of you. So everyone has their part to play to strengthen the body, to build up the body. Right? Mm -hmm. Every one of us has a part. To play it matters so I want to ask you a question what are you good at what do you think might be your gift what do you believe the Spirit is leading you to do if you aren't sure or you have an inkling let's talk about it let's see what we can do to help you find your place in ministry and in service let's pray about it you have something to bring to this congregation, to this community, and to the communities where we live. You matter to the kingdom of God. While God can do anything he desires to, listen to what I'm saying, while God can do anything he desires to, he cannot fulfill his word over you if you do not participate. Bring your gifts to the table. Let us work together to bring the good news to our neighbors and watch the Lord build his church. Hallelujah. Father God, thank you for your word. I am sorry. I, I don't feel as though, Father, I have executed it well. I ask you to forgive me for this. But I pray, Father God, that there is understanding within each person who has heard the message this morning, that they understand one thing, that they matter, that they are a part of this church, that they are a part of the whole body, and that they matter. Even if it's just something small like a pinky toe, Father God, they matter. 
I want them to know that, and I know you want them to know that too. And I ask, Father God, that you give each member of this church special revelation of the gifts you have given them so that they will see that they can do something for the kingdom. I pray, Father God, that you would impart in with the, each one of them a desire to serve in some way in the building up of this church. As John and Gordon spend so much time building up different members in this church, they minister personally to different members of this church. So each and every one of us has that same type of ministry to give and to offer our neighbors not just those here within this ministry, but those within the communities where we live. I pray, Father God, you would help them to see what they can do and that their lights would so shine among men that they would see their good works and give honor to and glorify the King. Father, we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.